When the Vatican needs a special item to expand an historical exhibit, one of the collectors they're likely to call is a parish pre priest in Duluth, Minnesota. Tonight, we'll talk about one of the largest collections of papal artifacts outside the Vatican. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. But before we get to our guest, I just want to mention that today is the Feast of St. John Vianney. He was born in 1786 and died in 1859. Uh, and he's known because, you know, in one sense, he was a very simple man, not necessarily the best when it came to book learning, but he had an uncommon amount of common sense and spiritual common sense. And so even though he had trouble passing the examinations to hear confessions, he ended up becoming the greatest confessor in France and through, through his lifetime. So he's now the patron saint of all priests. He used to be the patron saint of parish priests, but now he's the patron saint of all priests, religious, diocesan, parish, and others because we need such a great saint as St. John Vianney to look up to and to try to emulate in our own priestly lives. Well, tonight our guest is himself a priest, so it's his feast day as, as well. And he began to be a collector from a very young age. He started by collecting celebrity autographs from presidents to sports heroes. And after his ordination to the priesthood, he began collecting autographs and artifacts from celebrities of a religious nature. So please welcome tonight's guest, Father Richard Kunst. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be here. We uh, wish that it wasn't quite so hot for you, from, <laughs> for someone from up in Duluth. This is a lot warmer than you're used to a, up there. A, a little warmer from D Duluth, probably about uh, 40 degrees warmer than, <laughs> than what I'm used to for this time of the year. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's great to have you here because you have an interesting background. Mm -hmm. You started off collecting things as a boy. What made you want to do that? And what did you collect? Well, the first thing I collected were coins. I think that was a kind of a typical thing that kids collect. But then, in uh, actually, as I got, got a little bit older, in 1988, there was a presidential election. I was a senior in high school at that time. And, and uh, so I got really involved in politics and then the, the, the politicians that were running for office. And I'd go and see them at certain rallies and get their autographs and start to write to them. And I found out that I could get uh, autographs of primarily politicians at first just by writing to them. And so that's kind of, then it kind of piqued my, my interest in just collecting on that whole realm of collecting celebrity items like that. You know, this is a lot classier than what I did. I collected bottle tops. Bottle. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure it was a very nice collection. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of lame. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say that. but <laughs> Yeah, no, it was, it was lame. But uh, this is a much more interesting kind of collection. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you began with presidents and mm -hmm. politicians, but, you know, you've moved on both to ordination. That's right. But back in 1998. 98. 98. Yep. So uh, it's been 12 years for you as a priest, mm -hmm. and now you're collecting things related to our faith. That's right. The popes primarily, but also saints. There's a number of items that are uh, directly connected to the saints that I also have as well, including, uh, in particular, St. John Vianney's breviary, signed by him. Wow. And that's one of the... One How of the, did you get that? Well, that was actually at, on auction in France. And what the, uh, the type of um, uh, pedigree that came with it, so to speak, was that a woman had been cleaning out her grandmother's attic who had just died. And she found the breviary. And with the breviary was a note from an undertaker who had the breviary in his possession, at least dating to 1918. And so, you know, we can uh, uh, trace it back to that time. But, uh, the, you know, if you read the biography of John Vianney, you see that people stole his breviary as a relic. 
Oh. And, and of course, what happened after he died, I'm sure that there is other things that were probably pillaged. And so either it was probably taken after his death or probably more than likely it was actually taken during his lifetime as a relic. But what's really ni nice about is that it's signed by him on the inside. Wow. Yeah. Does the Vatican know you have this stuff? Uh, some do. Some yeah. of the Vatican know. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Uh, but th that's, that's really uh, an amazing relic to have. That's, yeah. that's what we would call a third class relic. Or second class, something second that they class, used. Something that they used. Right. Okay, something that right. they used. Yeah. Uh, that's, second class would be something that he owned and used. Right. Um, now, uh, in, in terms of this, what, how do you get stuff from the popes? Well, you know, the one line that I always use is that popes don't have rum and sales, and so it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not easy to get things. And usually what, what happens is, is uh, what's happening in Europe now, for the lack of vocations, there are convents and monasteries that are closing. Yes. And unfortunately what they're doing is liquidating a lot of their things just to survive. And so it really is opening the market to what we'd refer to as ecclesial antiquities, old things that were associated with these monasteries. And lots of times these monasteries would get gifts, you know, from the Holy Father, maybe directly, or, or maybe a, a member of the house went to go visit the Holy Father and received one individually and, you know, amass these things. And so the, the unfortunate side of this is that it's the vocation crisis in Europe that is allowing collections like mine to grow. I see. That is sad because, you know, we don't, I mean, it's neat to have this stuff. Mm -hmm. but it would have been better to have it in the context that's of the monastery. That's right. But, the, you know, the nice thing is, is that in the monasteries, you probably don't have like little museums or something like that. They're probably hidden away in some archives. But now what's happening, at least with what my intent is with my collection, is to, to really open it up to allow people to see it. And so I really want to bring these really rare items out to the public because people are inspired by that. People see the items that I have. And, and I've had people say to me after looking at portions of my collection, you know, this is like, I'm never going to get to the Vatican. This is the closest I'm going to get to it. And they're really touched by it. And so I'm hoping to use the unfortunate side of how these things get out and make it a positive. You never know. They might have a big attic in the Vatican that they need you to help go through. I, I'll give them my number. <laughs> <laughs> now, from, you know, uh, some of these people you've asked for autographs. Did anybody ever turn you down? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would say um, I used to write tons of letters when I was a kid, you know, in, in high school and even into college. And I'd say I'd probably get around 20% back when I was writing to these people, about 20%. And so that's actually a good turnover for a postage stamp in sure. a letter, you know. And so I, I actually amassed a huge collection, thousands of, of autographs of celebrities of every sort. And what I did was eventually just sell them because I totally lost interest in that and went totally to the religious and spiritual side. But did any of the spiritual or religious people ever turn you down? Well, I don't really, well, the popes are all dead except for Benedict, so I never really well, that, write to those guys. That would be a, yeah. that'll be a turn off. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I really don't do that for the, for the uh, religious, uh, you know, collection. Okay. I don't write to people for that. Sure, sure. Yes, I have to know who. Um, uh, didn't uh, Mother Teresa also Oh, that's you right. Know? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yes, Father Mitch, you've done your homework. <laughs> yes, she wrote me, I wrote to her and asked her for autographs. She chided me in the letter. Oh, is she, that right? Oh, yeah. She said, uh, at, at the time I wasn't a priest, she said, Richard, there's more important things than autographs. But she signed the letter anyhow. So, <laughs> so she still gave it to me. But it is one of my cherished items now because... Now she's know, a blessing. Yeah, blessed. See, that's people. sort of like getting a rookie baseball card, you know, before they're blessed or before the saints. Exactly. You know, some of that exactly. <laughs> that's another thing I did collect, too, is baseball cards. Um, now... Some of the things you brought with you are, are right here in front of us. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the thing that's right on, on, on top. On of the top, all right. That's probably, you know, the, the collection is quite massive, and I just brought things that I thought would be somewhat interesting and small, easy to care, but that's probably the most rare item I own. It's a, it's a seal. You know, when it started in, with the papacy of Pius or Clement IV. Clement IV started the fisherman's ring. Mm -hmm. The fisherman rings gives the seal for the authenticity and of the document. What year was Clement IV? Well, right around 1260, 1266, okay. right around there. And uh, what, so he started that, and obviously as the Holy See grew and the Vatican grew, then what they started to do was, you know, uh, have other seals because the Pope can't sit there and seal documents all day long. And so uh, they started creating other seals just for the sheer size of the output of, of manuscripts and documents. And then the secretaries could secretaries stamp Secretaries would it. do it, that's yeah. right. But now when the Pope dies, because the, the ring is the seal of authority, you know, they break the ring and then they bury it. Now all the other seals are also destroyed. All right, so they're, because it shows that the authority of this pon pontificate has now ceased with the death. And so no more manuscripts can be proclaimed by John Paul II because he's deceased. 
This is a, uh, a seal that escaped destruction, and it was uh, from the papacy of Gregory the 16th, who was pope from 1831 to 1846. And this is a, a good example of something coming out of a monastery in, uh, in Italy. In particular, I had asked the person who I had actually got it from in auction uh, where it came from, because you know, it shouldn't exist. And, and he said, his line was, one does not ask the sisters where they get their items. And so it was, it was very interesting, and that gave me enough information. That's the guy that went to Catholic school. That's right, exactly. He knew, what, he knew when not to tick off the sisters. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. And one of the things that uh, would, they would use with this, would they, they would stamp wax, mm-hmm. uh, to, to sealing wax, which That's is right. a, especially a hard wax, wax right. almost plastic. And uh, they would use that as a way to seal a document, mm-hmm. you know, when the wax was soft. And some of them were also ink. They did ink ones as well. Now, some of the other things that you have here, um, you know, uh, you know, like you have uh, a, a, another s- something that is stamped. That's right. Uh, what, what is that that stamped that piece of lead? Well, the, uh, you know, conclave means, conclave means to lock with a key. And when the cardinals get together to elect a pope in the Sistine Chapel, they lock the Sistine Chapel with a key, but they also seal it. They seal it shut. All the doors are sealed shut. And uh, what that is, is a, a lead seal that was used to uh, seal up the conclave of 1963 that elected Pope Paul VI. That's ex- exceedingly rare as well. And so uh, it looks remarkably unremarkable, but it's a remarkably rare item. Yeah, because, um, you know, that, that kind of seal is, is uh, uh, very important. Nobody can go in or out unless they die. That's right. Then they... And that, and that used to happen from time to time. Oh, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Uh, some of the cardinals used to be very, very old mm-hmm. um, and maybe not so nice. Right. <laughs> but, uh, uh, said the Chicago one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, the, but that would be there to, to seal the door so that no, everybody would know no one has gone in or out That's to right. try to trick anybody right. or to, and to they're, rig they're all, the election. And they're all broken after the election, after the Pope has been selected. And... You know, also uh, some of these seals. Uh, just before we go into anything else, there, there were there were wax. Yeah, there were wax uh, ones as well. Uh, how, how do you mean? Well, I mean, some of the seals. If you look at like old photographs of like the locked conclave and stuff right. like that, sometimes you'll see on some doors wax seals, and I think that those were primarily for the papal apartments, because when when the pope dies, his apartments are sealed. I mean, everything inside is sealed, and. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think the lead one was reserved primarily for the actual Sistine Chapel. Wax ones were reserved for the papal apartments. So that, that way they would have, uh, uh, you know, that. And there were, uh, there's also something about some Agnus Dei wax. Oh, yeah, Agnus Dei. The Agnus Dei is, uh, they, that's um, something that they used to do. That It was primarily during the Lenten time, but they wouldn't do it just during Lent. But during the Lenten time, they would do Agnus Dei, where they would melt all the Easter candles from the past year, and they put chrism oil in there in a big cauldron and then, uh, you know, stir it up. And then they'd make little like, like wax cylinders kind of, with a, you know, with the image of the lamb, you know, from, from the book of Revelations and then a saint on the other side. And that was done every year. And then the Pope's name would be underneath because the Pope would come out and then bless them. And uh, that was something that was quite significant. It was a very significant um, uh, sacramental up until, well, John the Twenty Third was the last Pope that did it. And so I wouldn't even say it was very significant at that time, but in past years, you know, like past centuries, all the way up to the first part of the 20th century, it was a pretty significant sacramental. Do you have any of those? I got a number of them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I think my oldest one is from the from the maybe the mid 1700s. See, and, and to have something made of wax that goes back to the 1700s to survive. Is, is really amazing because wax is well, wax can melt very exactly. easily. Exactly. That means that people, you know, the ones that have survived, people have taken good care of it because it was so important to them. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Now, you have a couple other things, too. Um, tell us, uh, first of all, about this large piece over here. Yeah, that is that is actually a ballot from the Second Vatican Council. Of course, you know, when the Second Vatican Council came, you know, all the bishops uh, from the world got together and they voted on different, you know, documents or different statements that the that the Holy See was going to make, and they voted with paper ballots. And, and so this is an actual ballot. It's the only one I've ever seen made available it's a little bit um, uh, different than what a ballot would have looked like, only because whoever had the ballot put stamps on there, and then they had it postage stamped with the last day of the, of the council. Obviously, those stamps would have been those postage st- stamps would not have been on the original ballots. No, no, but somebody put it on there just to show that 
That's this right. is the real thing. Yep, and that it was the last day of the council. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. it, and it said, instead of saying yes and no, it says plots it or non plots it. Right. That is pleasing or it's not pleasing. That's or right. Plots it, uxta, yeah. bo- uh, modem. Okay. You know, yeah, it's pleasing in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, maybe. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> now, so you got that. Now, then what's this other one that's got some writing on it? That is a um, business card from uh, Father Achilles Rati, who was... Uh, Why do you have his stuff? Well, he's a, he was a good librarian who became Pope Pius XI. Ah. And so this was his business card from when he was the librarian of the Ambrosian Library in Milan. And Which is, for folks who don't know, that it's uh, named after St. Ambrose, mm-hmm. and because he had been the Bishop, bishop of Milan. Milan. That's right. And the Ambrosian Library is... Significant. It's one of the most important libraries in Europe. That's right. So we're, we're not saying that he's just like any typical librarian here. It was a, it was a pretty significant post for him to have. Right, yeah. because th- this has a lot of ancient church documents That's and right. manuscripts in there. That's right, and then later he became the librarian at the, at the Vatican as well, cardinal librarian. In fact, if you go to St. Peter's Basilica, the uh, statue of him that is upstairs you know, on the main level has him holding a book, and it's because of his librarian background. Oh. And so that, that's a business card that he's scribbled some notes on, and then he signed on the bottom. You know, it, it's amazing that somebody who was a librarian, uh, again, of two very important libraries, mm-hmm. but then he would be chosen to be pope to as be pope. opposed to, say, uh, someone who was a diplomat That's or right. something else. That's right. The moral of the story is be good to your librarians. That's you a never good moral. Know. Now, one other thing that you have here that is especially interesting is this little holy card. Mm-hmm. What is that card? Well, you know, when, when priests are, are ordained, they are most often or very often will do a holy card to commemorate the, the, the right, ordination. Right, sure. You know, uh, I'm sure, did you do that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, and so did I. And this is a holy card that Father Joseph Ratzinger had printed up for his ordination. And so that's his, uh, his holy card from his priestly ordination back in 1951. So that's, that's especially now, again, you want to talk about rookie cards. It's a rookie card. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. that's like a rookie baseball card. That's right. It's, sure. a, it's a very nice one. Because very this nice is piece. when he's a simple priest, newly ordained. That's right. You know, nobody knows him really. And who's going to keep it for 50 years, you know? And more, so, now 60 almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they did. Well, that's, that's some cool stuff. Now, you, you've got these things, and I know that you take them on exhibit. Mm-hmm. From time to time. Right. Yeah. Um, what is the reaction you get from folks who see these on exhibit? They're, I think for a lot of people it's a spiritual experience. Uh, like I shared a little bit earlier is that um, I've had people come up to me looking at these items and say, you know what, this is, this is, this is moving to me because these are the vicars of Christ or the saints. You know, to see something that a saint actually signed or, mm-hmm. or touched or used or something like that or a pope, is, it, it can be a very spiritual experience. It's also a very learning experience. My, my main goal in this type of collection is to teach, to teach for, and, and to teach people about the Holy Father, about the, our church. And, and you know, I always say you can't, you can't love something you know little about. And I, my hope is to, to stir on the, the love that people would have for our Holy Father and for, for Mother Church by the use of these, these items. And, and I bring them up as, as much as I possibly can. I don't, you know, I don't bring out the whole collection that's only happened once, uh, and that was a number of years ago. But I bring, you know, if I'm going to give a talk somewhere, some, you know, it might touch on some item, then I'll bring it out. Now, what are there some items that are especially able to touch people that like, people say, oh, that really is cool? The Mother Teresa um, letter, I've got a couple letters from her. That's a, that's a big one. And then also I've got the uh, um, uh, chasuble that Pope John Paul II wore at uh, World Youth Day Denver for the the closing mass on... How did you get that? Well, it's, it's kind of an interesting story is that our former bishop, Bishop Dennis Snur, who's now in the Archbishop of uh, Cincinnati, he was the one that ran World Youth Day Denver, okay? And at the time, he was just a priest. Uh-huh. And uh, at the end of the successful uh, program of World Youth Day, the Holy Father gave it to him and as a gift and recognition and appreciation. And when he became our bishop, he told me that he had it, and of course, I, my mouth dropped. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I, I had the sin of envy at that point. And, and uh, you know, I'm the vocation director of the Diocese of Duluth. He appointed me. And so he said, he said, Father Kunst, he said, you get 25 seminarians at one time, and we'll give it to you. 
And so I worked. Of course, I had more than that motive, of course, but to get to, <laughs> to get more into the the diocese. And this and is like get vocations and win big <laughs> yeah, prizes. Exactly. We never quite got up to 25. We got up to a 23. Uh, but um, what had happened is that when we had our big, we had a big show in 2004 called The Vatican Comes to Lewis, which we showed everything. And on that occasion, he uh, he gave me the the chasuble, which was a very moving experience. Oh, that that really is cool. Yeah, it really is cool. And, one of the things about uh, the, the papacy is that we think of this as being this office mm -hmm. where great big things happen, and it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are great things, but it's also an office held by real concrete human beings. That's right. With all their little stuff. That's right. Yeah. And and you have to bring that alive. Oh yeah, and and like um, I've got letter openers that certain popes have used. You know, and and uh, clothing items, and each piece really tells a personal story about that pope. And for example, I've got, a, I've got a couple of books that were owned by Pope Clement XI before he was pope. And so on the inside, it's got a little wax seal with his coat of arms as a bishop. And when he was elected pope, he didn't want to get rid of the, the books, and so he made it a little bit fancier, and he rebound them with his papal coat of arms on the covers. Oh. And so you can see there was a book, couple of books that were very important to him that he wanted to keep when he moved over to the, to the Vatican. Now, and Clement the Twelfth. Clement the eleventh. Eleventh. Yep. So when was he? Seventeen hundred and seventeen twenty-one. Yeah. So he's, he's he pretty, again a couple hundred years that's old. That's right. Yeah. My I got old, much older items. I've got I've got an autograph of every single pope since sixteen twenty-three in some form or another, some manuscript, uh, many way older than that, but every single one since sixteen twenty-three. And I've got uh, also like zucchettos. Zucchettos are kind of an. What, what is a zucchetto? Zucchetto is the uh, the skull cap, basically. That'd be the the, uh, the layman's term to use uh, for that. And it's it used to be to cover the tonsure. That was the the origins of the, the and zucchetto. And again, a lot of people don't even know what a tonsure yeah, is. Yeah, when a, when a person w became a, a brother or a priest at a religious order, they would the form of a sign of obedience would be to cut. You know, Saint Anthony of Padua is the one we often look at where he's got the, the tonsure, the very clear tonsure in his statues and his images. They would do that as a sign of obedience. And that would be cutting some of the hair right some off from the, the back here to right. sort of make a, a circular hole. That's right, yep. And so the, the zucchetto is basically formed to keep them warm. Then eventually they grew in to have ecclesial different, you know, for the colors, the different rankings. And so now it's the sign of anybody. A priest can wear one, of course. They can wear a black one if they, if they so wish. But it's usually reserved for bishops, cardinals, and, and then the, the Holy Father. And so I've got, I've got a zucchetto from 10 of the last 11 popes. The only one I'm missing, missing is John Paul I. Other than that, I got everyone since Pius IX. Yeah, he didn't have too many zucchetti. John, not, not white ones, not no, John not Paul I, ones. being yeah. pope for only 33 days. And, uh, you know, some of the things that you have are not particularly precious items, right? Uh, like you've got bricks. Well, some bricks are precious. The Holy Year bricks, you know, the what the, makes them so special? Well, the Holy Year bricks are the ones are the bricks that are blocking up the Holy Year door. Every 25 years, of course, there's a Holy Year, and there's doors on each of the major basilicas in Rome. But uh, the primary one is on St. Peter's Basilica. It's totally blocked off except for the Holy Year, and the bricks are very ornate and. And uh, what they used to do is when the Pope would take the hammer and literally break down the, through the door and through the brick, people would clamor in and try and get pieces of it as relics. And so they, they kind of stopped doing that because people were getting injured and hurt. And so they started to regulate it more. And so these, these bricks were now distributed from the Holy See to certain individuals. And, and so I've got a number of bricks from different holy years. And those are pretty hard to come by. Yeah, because people want to hang on to those things. They want to hang on you to know, and. In the, the holy year, for instance, we had one in the year 2000, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, uh, that there's uh, on my uh, program, Threshold of Hope, mm -hmm. we had the Pope going through one of the holy doors. That's right. Uh, you know, because he, he, that to me was, it was a great symbol of him crossing over into the That's new right. millennium. That's right. Uh, and that was one, a, a big issue for him crossing to the new millennium. But uh, I didn't get any bricks. Oh, I don't have a brick from that holy year, unfortunately. Yeah. The most recent holy year, I don't have a brick from. My oldest one's from 1775, which is 50 years older than the oldest one in the Vatican Museum. The oldest one in the Vatican Museum is 1825. And, you know, it's interesting because that's also one year older than the United States. That's right. So yeah, that's, that's older that's than the United cool. States, a brick. Now, you also got something that nearly got a person excommunicated. What's this about? That's right. That was uh, that was Pope Benedict the Fourteenth. Pope Benedict the Fourteenth smuggled a letter out of 
out of the uh, conclave because you know conclave cum clave to lock with the key they seal the doors when they elect the pope and uh, he smuggled a letter out of conclave to a benefactor and uh, that was a violation of the rules of conclave even back then and so uh, he was risking certainly risking excommunication if not his own future election you know because it was the election of his predecessor before him mm -hmm. so that's an interesting piece little historical uh, little item so even some of the popes are troublemakers, huh? Uh, in, past, in the past, more than recently, thank heavens. But yeah, uh, yeah. we certainly have had our troublemaker popes. Yeah, that, that we have had. I've been reading some of the popes of the 15th and 16th century, and yeah. some of them were troublemakers. Yeah, yeah, to say the least. Yeah. But, you know, that is one of the amazing things. When we look at the history of the papacy, there have been popes who were more of an emphasis on the human side sure. than on the grace, the gracious side. Right. Um, and some of them were downright scoundrels. Do you have mm -hmm. anything from scoundrels? Yes, uh, in particular, Alexander VI. My favorite the, the scoundrel. Bo the Borgia, you know, the Borgia Pope. I've got... Um, the grandfather, the great-grandfather of St. Francis Borgia. I didn't know he was the grandfather. I thought he was a great cousin. Grandfather. Oh, no, okay, no, all right, all right. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I've got a papal bull, a complete bull from him. It's a, so it's the... It's a large parchment and then the, uh, the lead seal attached to it. Uh, I also have a few coins from the Papal States during his pontificate. But things from the Borgia Pope, from, well, from Alexander VI in particular, is uh, it's hard to get things from him because he's kind of a collectible type of guy, you know, and he's right. kind, of, kind of hard to come by. Another one who I have, I wouldn't call him a scoundrel. He, maybe he was before he was Pope, uh, but afterwards he became, you know, much more better was uh, Julius II. And it's actually one of my favorite items because I'm I'm kind of fond of Julius II. And if you if you watch the uh, Agony of the Ecstasy with uh, Rex Harrison and and Charlton Heston, it kind of gives somewhat of a tilted pitch, picture of uh, what he was like. But uh, I've got a, a manuscript signed by him twice, and he was and that would have been uh, in 1504 that he signed it. Yeah, and that that was a time you know the the movie didn't make it very clear. He made it look as if the Pope was a military leader because he just did it for fun and was on a lark, but the, the papal states were in grave danger That's from right. you know, all kinds of invasion. That's right, and they were fighting, and he was on the front line. You know, he, he did fight. You know, oh, he, yeah, he was yeah. referred to as the warrior pope. He's also referred to as Julius the Terrible because, I mean, he got his way, and there was no getting around it, right. in, in particular with Michelangelo. Right, right, yeah. right. So, you know, these are, uh, again, uh, you're, you're right, he may not be such a scoundrel, but, you know, the agony and the ecstasy makes him look like a bigger that's scoundrel right. than that's he right. actually was. That's right, and he's a big character in papal history, yeah. Julius yeah. II. Now, any of the other items that you particularly um, uh, mentioned? Well, the, the three favorite ones are the ones I mentioned, Julius II, the, the Chaswell of John Paul II, and the Breviary of John Vianney. But I've got uh, a number of saints. I've got Lawrence of Merdizi, Charles Borromeo, Robert Bellarmine, John Bosco, uh, Alphonse de la Gloire, Paul the Cross, you know, a lot of the saints. Um, uh, and then my, my earliest pope autograph is from 1457 from uh, Pope Pius II when he was a cardinal. Oh, yeah. It was just months before his election. He was a cardinal of Siena. And so, and then my oldest, well, my oldest complete item is, is um, from uh, Clement IV, 1266. It's a full bull. But then I also have a small, just the seal. The bull is just the seal. You know, but the, the seal is attached originally to the parchment, which was the proclamation of the Holy Father. And I've got the seal from uh, Innocent III, who of course approved the Franciscan order. And so that dates back, that's my earliest individual item. Be careful about the friars here, to make sure they... <laughs> I didn't bring that one with me on purpose. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> All right, we need to take a little break, but we're gonna be back in about two minutes. And we wanna get some of your questions and your comments to Father uh, about this collection that he's got. So please stay with us.
Thank you and welcome back. You know, you can find out a lot more about Father Kunst's uh, collection if you go to his website, which is www.papalartifacts.com. And papal artifacts is one word. So www.papalartifacts.com. Okay. Yep, and that website is just getting started. We got so, some people helping me out with putting that together, and uh, cool. and they're being very helpful. And and it will eventually have everything on the collection and a story, picture of everything. It's just getting started, but it's a good start. Oh, that's great. And then also we have a really nice group of people here from different parts of the country, and we'd love to have you come. There's some of these folks came as a group, and others came as families, and others as individuals. If you can come to visit us, you're more than welcome. Just contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to the website, www.ewtn.com. And they'll give you all kinds of information about scheduling of programs, scheduling of the masses, both here and up in Hansville, and getting into one of the tours of the students. Did you guys go on a tour yet? Yeah, the good, good. Did you have a nice time? Yeah. See, they liked it. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and of course, they'll let you know where all the good restaurants are. Father and I went to the Arndale Cafe today. Very good. Fried uh, green tomatoes. First time to have fried green tomatoes. First time ever. First time to have black eyed peas. Uh, first ever. First time to have... Uh, I'm from Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah, I know. You <laughs> never had collard greens before no, either. No, I haven't had those either. See, and so, so we had all I'll be sick stuff. tonight, but it, it was great at no, supper. No, it was, that's good. You won't be sick. You'll be fine as frog hair. <laughs> good and snuff. Well, you ready for some questions? Sounds good. All right, let's go to a question here from our studio. Man, where are you from? I'm from Wartburg, Tennessee. Good to have you here. Welcome. <laughs> And what is your question? Um, I was wondering if either of you could explain simony and how that applies, or if it does apply, to the buying and selling of relics. All right. Well, well simony is a, it's a, basically it's a sin of, of uh, um, buying or selling blessed items, holy items. Like, and it comes from si Simon Magnus. Magnus in the Acts of the Apostles, who wanted to buy the, the power, the special magic that he saw in the apostles. And, of course, yeah, and, and what he thought was magic was really the gift of the, the holy, holy Spirit. Spirit. That's right. And so uh, you, can't buy that. you can't buy that and you still can't buy that. And, and that's a, it's a very legitimate question that I get on a regular basis because of the nature of what I do have in the collection. And, you know, the, the one thing that's important to note in this collection is that I don't really have these items in a, um, they're not used in like sacred settings. I don't have them for devotional purposes. They're for histor historical purposes. And, and uh, you know, lots of times when you see some of these things on the market, these days, like on eBay and stuff like that, which is the unfortunate reality that we are in, it's not necessarily a bad idea if you're going to get those things off of the market, if you're going to keep it for a sacred purpose or for an important purpose in the church. And so uh, really the, the question of simony, since these aren't technically relics, although I do have you know, items out of popes and saints that they, like they signed and stuff like that, they're not relics in the traditional sense of the term that we would use them in an ecclesial spiritual setting. Well, there was that one situation where a man had a host from that's a mass right. celebrated by Pope John Paul II. Okay. And he sold it on eBay. That's right, that's right. And then eBay clamped down on that. Right, yeah. right. The Catholic Church made it known to them, but a mm -hmm. Knight of Columbus bought it just so that it wouldn't be desecrated. Right, right. And he couldn't even keep it. No, of course Because not. it had to be... That's right. Know, that would be, that'd be like a, the height of simony, because <laughs> that's, right. that's Jesus Christ himself. But the, the man wasn't Catholic and didn't really understand right. the nature of it for right. us. Right, right. But you, you can, you know, to, to buy relics is not a, a Simon, that's rescuing them. That's right. That's right. If you're doing it for that purpose, obviously. I mean, and it is, it is a, the situation that we find ourselves in now, of the world of the Internet, the world of online auctions. It's amazing what you can find. And, uh, and again, a lot of that comes from churches in Europe and monasteries and convents. Yeah. Yeah. We have a caller on, online. We have Melissa. Hello, Melissa. Hello. Hi, where are you from? Pennsylvania. Great, and what is your question? I was wondering where Father gets his resources to obtain uh, the items. All right, where do you get your resources to buy this? I'm broke, <laughs> almost literally. I, I, I have nothing other than a priestly salary. I put about 70% of my income into the collection, and I'm always in debt. 
I'm always paying off things because I've got line of, a line of credit. And so I don't have credit card debt, I have Pope debt. And, and it really is, <laughs> it's really literal. And, uh, and so Can I- Can I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. Never work for the federal government. Yeah. <laughs> we, got, we don't need any more of that. They're good enough at that on their yeah, own. Really. But, but really, you know, a lot of it for me is that I won't buy anything unless I know it's a good deal. I mean, a really good deal. And sometimes things have fallen in my lap that shouldn't have, you know, that- that uh, Well, that, like that stamp of that, uh, no, Pope, no doubt Pope about Gregory. it. And, but other things that, that have extreme amounts of value that I got for dirt cheap for various types of reasons. And you know, I view this as a vocation within the vocation. I'm using this stuff to teach people and hopefully inspire people. And, and so I really do see the hand of God in a lot of this because there's no, as I say, there's no reason why a guy from Duluth, Minnesota should have what he has in Duluth, Minnesota. Right, right, but, but you do. Yep. And I imagine there's something to do with your ability to be persistent. I'm persistent, that's right, and I, I'm very persistent. I spend a, a certain amount of time in the early morning before I go to pray to, uh, to check and scour online. And, uh, and to, to lots of my online stuff is in Europe. And so, uh, uh, and it's in foreign languages and I just know kind of, I'm not a linguist, but I know a lot of key words and I'm looking for, and, uh, and I do very well with that. And there's a lot of people out there that are very good to me that are in the business, but know that because I'm a priest, and there's not a whole lot of priests that are doing this. A lot of them are just, you know, average, you know, Joe Sixpack, so to speak. And so they want, they want the priest to have the first dibs, and often all people approach me before they put it on the market. Okay, all right. We have another question from our studio. And sir, where are you from? Cape Cod, Massachusetts, Father. Good to have you here, welcome. Glad to be here. Uh, Father Kunst, I have a question. In, in following this discussion tonight, um, you referenced that there are different degrees or levels of relic. Mm -hmm. I think you referred to like a second degree and a third degree relic. Mm -hmm. And, and course, I'm curious, degree, yeah, you, you know, what, what, what's the difference? So what makes something a first, deg uh, first, first class. class relic? Yeah. As we, we call them first class rather than yeah. degree. A first class relic is a par part of the body. Most often a chip of bone or sometimes a hair or even in the case of an incorrupt saint, even a piece of the flesh. So that, that, that's the common first class. Second class is the you know, items that they wore, most often a little piece of cloth. You'll get a holy card with a little piece of cloth uh, you know, of a particular saint embedded in there, or something that they use, like that, like that brevier of John Vianney would be considered a second class relic. Then a third class relic is a piece of cloth, generally, that was touched to the corpse or touched to the body of the saint. Okay, so, so that, uh, that would be the, the third class kind of relic. Right. And you know, usually when you get reliquaries, it's first class relics. That usually. Mostly in there. That's the most common. Uh, some saints like uh, Saint uh, Maximilian Colby, for instance. You can't they, get one. There are no That's first right. class relics That's because right. his so body was incinerated by mm -hmm. the Nazis. Yep. But you know, the, uh, the, the, for most saints, the first class relics are what you get. That's right, in the little reliquaries, little, the thikas, little, they call them thikas. And, and the, the little pieces of bone, yep. usually, like say, maybe a piece of hair. Right, right, okay. yeah. Good. We have another question from our studio. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from New York. I'm visiting for the first time here in Alabama. Do you like it down here? Yes, Good. very much so. I'm very and impressed. And what is your question? Okay, I'm very impressed with your collection, Father. Uh, and I'd like to say, you know, the um, Vatican collection treasures have been reproduced into costume jewelries. What steps are you taking to protect your collection, especially the autographs? Because especially now, where it's so easy to copy, you know, to photocopy things. Right. Um, that's a, thank you for the, for the question. That's a good question. You know, the, the, the Vatican Library or Vatican Museum, of course, are, are licensing some things to be re replicated. You can go to the Vatican Museum, as I'm sure you've been there, and you can buy, you know, some duplicates of things there. So, sure. so it is sure. regulated, so it's not like they're not, uh, they're not regulating. But in regards to, to my collection, it's not... It's not generally, it's not, it's not on um, display right now. It's, it's in a, I often, I just refer to it as an undisclosed location. So it doesn't have, there's not public access. Now this website that we're just getting started is gonna be the first time where people are gonna have at least access to images of these, of these items, but uh, they're probably not gonna be good enough to where they'd be able to replicate it. So I don't anticipate in my lifetime that I'm gonna have an issue of people trying to duplicate from my collection. To, to, to be fraudulent. Right, right, right. And, you know, so, so here um, you, you've got a number of these artifacts. Are there any, one of the things I was wondering about is whether you have any particular artifacts from 
turning, key turning points of papal history. For instance, anything from the time of the Reformation or maybe the World Wars or, yeah, yeah, or the, the Napoleonic Wars. Right, well, um, like directly associated with that time. Yeah, and, and the papacy. The, the most historic item that I own, that would be, that's the, the document is actually mentioned in textbooks or at least in history books or biographies about these particular saints is a, an, uh, it's a, a brevis or a brief it's referred to as just a brief letter from Saint Pope Pius V who was in the, in the, you know, the 1560s and he, he wrote to uh, the Senate of Milan asking them to support Saint Charles Borromeo, obviously was not a saint at the time, he was the Bishop of Milan, Charles Borromeo in suppressing the religious order, the, uh, the Brothers Humiliati. The, and oh, yeah. and so it's actually a very instrumental uh, manuscript in regards to the suppression of a religious order that had gone corrupt during the time of the Counter Reformation. So that that would be the most historic item that I own, that I would say that you'd find in history textbooks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, a, a lot of these things that you have are in incidental items. Like for instance, the, that seal by the Pope that would have been used by one of his secretaries. That's right. But we don't know which one. No, nope. and we don't know which documents actually would be stamped That's with right. it. You know, you That's could right. you could probably figure it out if you had the documents. Sure, because there might be just a slight flaw or something that would of be course. of course noticeable there, just like you can with uh, type on mm -hmm. the typewriter. Right, but um, you know, some of these things uh, that you have would be just mostly items that would be around the papal household. That's right. That's right. I've got a I've got a a, a slipper that. Um, well, let me back up. Pius X, when he was elected, he had very poor circulation. You'll see pictures of him, close-up pictures of his hands, and they're just really, really puffy, uh, poor circulation. So his sisters actually moved to Rome when he was elected and started to care for him in, in many ways. And one of the ways was to make him particular uh, sl nice slippers that were more comfortable because of his circulation. So he didn't really, sometimes he would walk around with a regular type of shoes, but for his day-to-day -day use, he would walk around with these slippers that his sisters made. And so I've got one of those that would have been something very common for, we, you, he would have had it in his closet. You know, some other clothing items, you know, pieces of cassock and, you know, the fascia of the, from Pius IX on his cassock. And, uh, you know, I mean, lots of, uh, lots of uh, different clothing items, Roman collars from, di from different popes. Now, one of the, the things that uh, I, I've had questions about, and I don't know if you know this or not, but there's some uh, items uh, about the Pope's clothing. Why does the Pope wear a white cassock? Yeah, the white, it actually originates from St. Pius V because Pius V was the first Dominican to be elected, and Dominicans wear white as a habit. And Pius V wanted to just retain his, his uh, um, religious order identity into the papacy upon being elected, so he kept the habit. And so it really started with him. And so in, in, his, uh, in his honor, the uh, Pope started just to wear white in, to start that tradition because he was a great Pope. He was a saintly, holy Pope. He's a saint. And, uh, and so that's become the tradition now for the Popes who are white because of Pius V. As a matter of fact, have, well, well the Pius X is the only other Pope that's been canonized but last, since him. But the last 500 years, we've had two Popes that have been canonized, Pius V and Pius X. Uh, and the first, uh, 300 years, everybody but one was canonized. Liberius. Right. Yeah, poor Liberius. But, yeah, poor Liberius. But, uh, but another thing, too, is the popes wear red shoes. Why red? You know, that might be a stumper. I don't know why the red is. Do you know why it is? No, I don't. Uh, I, I, I don't it they, might just be a tradition that it goes well with white, I suspect. I could be. Could be. But, but although John Paul II wore brown. See? All right, we have a caller online. We have Ken there. Hello, Ken. Hello, fathers. How are you? Fine, thanks. Where are you from? Uh, Dallas, Texas. Oh, great. Good to have you. What's your What's your question? I have a couple items that have been blessed by John Paul II. One of them is a picture when he was here in San Antonio in '87, and another is a medal. And I was just wondering if there's any kind of relic type value uh, to those items. Well, you know, a lot. You know, I mean, uh, not in the same format that we would talk about like a relic that you'd get like in the little reliquaries that we've talked about but but you know I mean by the by the nature of their orders priests can bless and uh, and um, uh, bishops can bless and popes and and it's always been a sacred thing to have popes bless items in fact when you go to the Wednesday audience in Rome at the end of the Wednesday audience the pope does a blessing which he, which he intends to bless any religious items that you have at that time and so they make it a very deliberate point of of saying that 
And so it, it's and a, also when the Pope comes out for the Angelus. That's right. He'll do anytime he does a blessing. In essence, it can be a blessing of your of your items. And so it's a, it's a nice memento of of a maybe a, a visit that you had or an audience that you had with the Holy Father or a relative of yours had. But as far as um, uh, you know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be on the same level certainly as a relic, and it certainly you know wouldn't be on the same level as like a rare item because you know these blessed items are important because they're blessed by the Holy Father and intended to be blessed by the Holy Father. But, uh, but um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands. thousands. As a matter of fact, at any one of those times, like uh, you know, uh, when last time I went to a, a papal uh, Angelus, um, you know that I, I had a bag, a bag of rosaries yeah. and one of those blessed, and I gave them to that's people right. that I knew uh, as a result. Yeah. You know, so that's that's a. They're cool nice thing. items, and they they help you remember the times that the Pope was uh, near your hometown, in yeah. that in that instance. Do you have any uh, artifacts from John Paul II? I do. I have, uh, as I already mentioned, I have his chasuble from World Youth Day in uh, Denver. Oh, I've hmm. got a hiking stick. He used to hike in the woods. We know that from a lot of pictures of him hiking in the woods. And I've got one of those. I've got a zucchetto. Um, I'm trying to think. I've got a sacramentary that he used in the United States uh, for a mass. Sacramentary is the book that the priest uses for the prayers during the mass. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. I've got a, I've got a number of items. If you go to the website, papalartifacts.com, you'll see a lot of them. Speaking of zucchetti, um, the, I heard that there's a tradition that if you buy a, the Pope a brand new zucchetti, he'll give you one of the is used ones. That's right. That's a very old tradition, and uh, uh, I don't know the origins of it, but it certainly dates back the last couple hundred years for sure. And you go to the papal clothing maker, which by tradition, at least since the year 1800, is Gamarelli. That's right behind the Pantheon in Rome. And there's only one person that wears white, so there's only one size of zucchetto. And so, if you if you if you have if you have a if you know that you're gonna have an opportunity to meet the Holy Father the next day or later that day, you can go to Gamarelli and purchase one and take a chance at and seeing if the Holy Father will swap. Now, Pius the Twelfth is the one who really made that a popular tradition, and uh, uh, John Paul II, in in essence, did not. He that was not a tradition that he that he uh, recognized. But Benedict the Sixteenth, however, has certainly gone back to. He's probably the easiest one to get since Pius XII, Benedict XVI. Is that right? Yeah. Is that yeah. right? And incidentally, there, there's only been two popes in since the year 1800 that have not used Gamarelli, and that was Pius XII and Benedict XVI. You can still buy the zucchettos there, but you cannot. They don't have their clothing tailored from Gamarelli. Oh, is that right? Two, yep. Why not? They they, they just got kept, a better deal. Well, they kept their their tailors from beforehand. I suppose they were in Rome for such a long period of time. Both of them were prior to that a different one. There's not a Walmart for popes. There's not. Think, you know, no, so you no, can't go just no, to the discount no, store. No, exactly. <laughs> 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 but Gamarelli's in its own right is an interesting place to visit when you when you go over to to Rome, and a lot of people don't know about it because you can see the storefront. You can see you know like the little zucchettos, the the white zucchettos that you can purchase there. Oh, that's a good idea. No. Uh, especially if the, uh, I don't plan on meeting the Pope, but I've mm -hmm. never met a Pope. Really? Have you met any? I have. I, I, I met um, uh, John Paul II about seven times, and that's a true blessing. I, was, I can celebrate Mass with him in his private chapel three times. In fact, within 48 hours of my being ordained a priest, I met John Paul II. Cool. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. And the very first thing he said to me was, you're too skinny. And that's exactly what he said. He pointed out and said, you're too skinny. I thought well, he was going to say something inspirational, but he didn't. That's a guy in his 80s sort of yeah. uh, saying to a guy who still can be skinny. That's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, the older we get, the less easy it is for us to be skinny. I know, skinny. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> they may compliment. come for you, may not. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and also to have some of the things from him. You know, one of the other elements, you know, people I'm sure are amazed at at these items, but is there a spiritual component to what they derive from seeing your collection? Yeah, and you know, I can't speak to that because interior, you know, I mean, they really do have an interior. You can see it sometimes when people are amazed by what they're looking at. And if you're looking at something like, you no, know, like just, you know, just this past uh, week, Mother Teresa's relics were in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and I just saw a picture in the newspaper, I, didn't, I wasn't there, I saw a picture in the newspaper of her sandals. And just looking at that for me in the newspaper is kind of a spiritual moment. It's like, here's right. the saint that was taking care of the poorest of the poor, and those were the sandals, the, the most humble part of her clothing right there. And so uh, certainly these, these things that are associated with the vicars of Christ throughout history, that were Christ's representative here on earth and in that most special way, 
uh, can't help but churn the spiritual juices, so to speak, in a lot of people. And I've had so many people tell me that, people that have been very moved by looking at these items. And again, lots of times I take these items out primarily when I'm teaching. And so to, to teach about it and then, and then see an item is, is something that's even more moving. What kind of teaching do you do? Well, I, in my own parishes, I've got apologetics classes, and they're pretty successful. We get over 100 people on a regular basis at any given class. And so that's one. But then I'm kind of known as the Pope priest, so to speak, in my <laughs> diocese and the, a few dioceses in the area. So lots of times I will have people uh, contact me to come to their parish to talk about something in particular. Uh, I really do apologetics a lot, do a lot of scripture stuff. Uh, but papal history is the, the thing that I'm obviously more well known for and that I'm more into. And so uh, I'm traveling quite a bit in the diocese and even outside of the diocese to, to give talks about, about these items. And then if I'll focus on like one particular item and give the history of it and maybe the interesting story about how I got it, then that can be a really moving experience for people. And, and you have to do all this plus be a parish priest. Be a parish priest, that's right, and vocation director. And vocation that's director. Right. Yeah. You know, just as a plug for what you do, you know, this is one of the reasons why we need more young priests. Mm -hmm. You know, that Am I young? I would say yeah. so. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're still, well, maybe middle, but early middle. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, 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 need, we need young men to enter the priesthood because, you know, our Lord said it well, mm -hmm. that the, the, the harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. That's right. There really is a great harvest out there, and there's a hunger for spiritual needs. There's no doubt. Uh, and... And there's a wide variety. I mean, you've, you've carved out a certain niche mm -hmm. by your collection. Right. But there are so many other ways in which, you know, other priests are going to carve out their niches. That's right. And for, for young men to consider the priesthood is a, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. I mean, you, you still like it, don't you? Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's my passion. I, I mean, know it. My, my, my profession is my hobby. Yeah. I mean, and, and how many people can say that? I know. You know, and then in, in just in reference to what you were saying in regards to these little niches, I mean, we were talking about hunting before. How many guys are attracted, who, real men that are wanting to discern the vocation that wouldn't even think of priests going hunting? Well, they can see a real man priest go hunting, and that's, you know, I mean, that's something that can be attractive. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, each priest, we're not cookie Especially cutters. Especially if you help you clean the animal. That would be at a particular uh, uh, helpful part of the hunting. <laughs> <laughs> But, we're, but priests are not cookie cutters. We each have our own interests and we each have our own exactly. strengths. And, exactly. and so there's always, there's always room for young men into the priesthood. There's always a whole host of ways that you can utilize your interests. And interest. there's room for a wide variety of guys. That's right. You now, we don't want everybody to be doing the same thing. You know, uh, how many guys are going to do the kind of collection you do? But, right. you know, and hopefully none of them will do bottle top collections. But <laughs> they're, they're like I did. Yeah. But they're... But there, there'll be other, uh, so many other things that, you know, I come across priests around the country who are just doing marvelous work right. in particular areas, and all of us together make up the, this, this unity, that's right. and that's, that's a really right. cool thing. So that, that's uh, one of the things, too, uh, uh, I want to uh, invite people you know, to go back to your website, mm -hmm. because that's, again, it's www papalartifacts.com. And people can learn an awful lot about these artifacts just by going to your website. That's right. We'll have photos of every item. Right now, it's just in its infancy. But uh, uh, I've got a great webmaster. I've got great people helping me out and putting that thing together. And uh, I wouldn't be able to do it without them because they're doing a lot of work. So I'm, I'm, dictating, I'm dictating every single item in this collection. And there's tons of items. And then I've got somebody who's actually typing them down and we're getting them into the computer. Really? I've got people that are doing the photographs for me. You know, these are all people working out of their own, you know, goodwill to want to do this. I have a webmaster who's an excellent webmaster. Uh, just check the web. It's a, it's a phenomenal website. I'm particularly happy about it and excited about it because it's just new. It's just getting started. And so uh, because it's in its infancy, be patient with it because there's probably only right around 50 to 60 photographs on there right now. There's probably around 300 items, right around 300 items that are explained right now but there's not the images for them except for about 50 and and we're just a fraction of the way done so because you said you had about 1500 items yep. right yeah in total so, so that'll be a, that'll be a big, big it'll be uh, a big website and it'll be unique there's no other website like it because i've looked there's no other website to where you can really seek out items directly associated with the popes even the mundane items that tell their story yeah well, that's a pretty cool thing and it, it's um uh, 
You know, one of the things, too, that what you're doing by getting these other folks to help you is, you know, they're learning. this is they're learning. But it is part of our mission is also to be expanding out to doing, you know, not just us doing it exactly. all, but involving the church. That's where we're, we show that leadership. That's right. And, pastors. and these people are showing their dedication for the love of the church by doing what they're doing because yeah. they're, they're doing it out of their own goodwill. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight. You, I appreciate Father. it. And would you join me in blessing our audience? May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, it's not a, a usual kind of guest. I mean, uh, so many of our guests are doing very interesting things, and this is one of the more interesting items that we've had. But we can bring Father Kunst and all the other guests here because this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible. So we're going to ask you to please make sure that you keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And that way we'll be able to pay all of our bills and feed them and bring him over <laughs> here and make sure that he doesn't stay so skinny. <laughs> That's why we've got to get him more of those fried green tomatoes. <laughs> so God bless you and thank you all for your support.